Hi, and welcome to Tom Kennedy Science, and I'm your host, Dr. Tom Kennedy. I'm continuing my series on how we regulate gene expression. And we've talked about a few different types on our previous videos, from pre- and post-transcriptional regulation to epistasis. Now we're going to talk about epigenetic inheritance, and this is truly a new frontier in science. And the reason why is because what happens to us in our life can be passed down to our kids through epigenetic inheritance. So what exactly is epigenetic inheritance? So basically this is changes to how our DNA can be regulated. And these changes can be anywhere from temporary to almost completely permanent. Now importantly, this is not a mutation. And I did say what happens to us can be passed to our children. Usually we think of some type of mutation that is a cause of that. But no, in this case, it's epigenetic inheritance that can be inherited. Now, there are two important ways this works. One is called a histone modification, and the other one is DNA methylation. Oh wait, I've never talked about histones before. What in the world is a histone? Well, you remember that I told you once upon a time in a previous lecture, or maybe you didn't know this, but inside each of one of our cells, is like three billion base pairs of DNA. That's like six feet of DNA coiled up inside of our cell nucleus. Well, there's lots of ways that we fold our DNA. And one way we fold them is through these little proteins called histones. Like imagine a ball that you wrap your DNA around. So those histones help organize our DNA inside of our cell nucleus. Okay, you can imagine a scenario, you've got a liver cell and you've got a skin cell. Sometimes you need genes, sometimes you don't. So you can actually pack away genes that you're not going to be using. It's like uh, packing away your Christmas ornaments, right? You don't need them throughout most of the year, so you pack them away, you put them in boxes and put them away. We can do the same for DNA, or at least our cells do. And there are some ways that we can modify the histones to actually attract the DNA more closely, in that case, you get less gene expression, or we can modify them that the DNA is packed less tightly and you would get more gene expression. And the reason why that works is it goes all the way back to our transcription factors. These are proteins that initiate transcription, okay? So if you're packing away your DNA very tightly, your transcription factors can't get in there. In fact, all your apparatus for doing transcription can't get in there and you can't have transcription. So there you go, it stops gene expression. Now the one that I'm gonna focus on more today is called DNA methylation. Okay, methyl groups. I, you may not know what a methyl group is, but imagine a carbon with three hydrogens attached to it. And what happens is, whenever you need to start methylating DNA, what you're doing is you're adding these methyl groups to your DNA and specifically, you're only adding the methyl groups to the cytosines, right? To one of the four nucleotides. And what that does is it changes the shape of your DNA. And in the molecular biology, or in all of biology, shape really matters. So if you change the shape of your DNA, guess what? Transcription doesn't work. So DNA methylation, this is a, a way that can stop transcription and it can do it almost permanently. And this is very important for things like cell differentiation. Now think about this. You have like 200 different cell types in your body. You've got muscle cells, skin cells, liver cells, neurons, different types of neurons. Each one of these cells is expressing different genes. And in fact, a muscle cell may never express genes like alcohol dehydrogenase that are in your liver to break down alcohol. So since it's there, what will happen is inside your muscle cells, it will permanently turn them off by methylating them. So as part of our growth and development, as our cells differentiate, different regions of our chromosomes with specific genes on them will become methylated, permanently turning them off. Now, this is inheritance, right? So what that means is these patterns of DNA methylation are passed down from parent to daughter cells. So if I have a muscle cell and I permanently turned off the genes for alcohol dehydrogenase, when those muscle cells are dividing, guess what? They pass on that same 
level of inheritance. They pass on the same epigenetics so that those genes are turned off in the daughter cells as well. You can see this. You ever seen a calico cat? No two calico cats ever look the same. Have you also noticed that they're females? Well, why is that? Well, it turns out that female mammals were determined by XX chromosomes. Female cats only need one functioning X chromosome. So they turn the other one off and they do so randomly. Now, the importance here is that the genes for fur color are on the X chromosome and we're randomly turning them off. So, hmm, and the, and the random X chromosome inactivation is done by methylating it all over the place and it permanently turns it off. So every time you have a cell with a specific X chromosome turned off, the daughter cells will get the same X chromosome turned off. So if you have an X from your mom and an X from your dad, and if you turn the X chromosome off from your dad, then in all the daughter cells, that same dad's X chromosome will also remain turned off. So you can imagine a calico cat. You've got an X chromosome from dad with a allele for black fur. You've got an X chromosome from mom with an allele from white fur. So what happens is we've got this embryo, we start randomly inactivating these X chromosomes by methylating them. So we're adding these CH3 groups all to it, right? Basically stops transcription. And then what happens is we, as those cells continue to grow and divide through mitosis, those same chromosomes are always inactivated. So you can see the pattern on a calico cat. In this case, all the black fur is from the dad's X chromosomes and all the orange fur is from the mom's X chromosomes. And you can actually see the pattern of X chromosome inactivation on these cats. How cool is that? It doesn't stop there, the importance of DNA methylation. Okay, so DNA methylation is really important for imprinting. And here's what happens. You know, I'm producing gametes and if you're a female, you're also producing gametes. We're all producing gametes. My gametes, my sperm are imprinted as male. If you have eggs, they're imprinted as female. And this is really important. One of them is you can't combine two eggs to form an individual. You can't combine two sperm to form an individual. You have to have the male and the female because we haven't learned how to strip the imprinting off and re-imprint a male as a female and vice versa. And let me show you why you just can't like combine the genes of two eggs or two sperm to form an offspring. Okay, so you got an embryo, right? And this embryo is growing. And one of the ways that the embryo attaches to the mom is, and the placenta acts as a gateway between the mom and the growing embryo that has all the exchange of nutrients. Now here's what's interesting. Both the mom and the dad contributed genes to grow a placenta. However, the mom's genes are turned off and it's only the dad's genes that are used to grow the placenta. So they're, when they say that babies are like little parasites growing in the mom, there's some truth to that. The baby is trying to pull as much nutrients as possible from the mom and the mom has to regulate it so it doesn't harm her or cause problems. So that's very interesting that the placenta is driven by the male's genes. Even though the moms are there, they're just turned off. And there are all kinds of other examples of how maternal and paternal genes are switched on and off based on imprinting during our growth and development. And that's why you can't combine two eggs or two sperm to form an, a, an individual. You have to have a male and a female, at least until we learn how to strip the imprinting and re-imprint them. Now, importantly, um, what we're learning with epigenetics is that what happens to the parents in their lifetime can be transmitted to their children, and especially in how the way that genes are regulated. Now remember, epigenetics, this is not mutations, okay? We're not changing the actual sequence of the genes, we're changing how those genes are regulated. And here's our one of our first clues. World War II, there was a Dutch hunger winter. Basically, the Nazis put barricades up around the Netherlands, they sided with the allies and they went to like 30 percent of their normal calories during this winter it was really really bad there was a lot of people that died of malnutrition and hunger however not everybody died and there were people that had babies d during and after the dutch hunger winter so we followed the effects of the famine for a couple generations 
So here's what we learned. If a mom conceived before the famine and gave birth during the famine, the babies were born underweight. That makes sense. Most of the weight is gained in the last trimester. So if the mom is malnourished, it makes sense that the babies are also small. However, those children remained underweight for the rest of their lives. So there is something going on with the imprinting of their metabolism. Not only that, and the same happened to their children. So that imprinting lasted for at least two generations. Second, women conceived during the famine. They didn't get enough calories. But if they gave birth about three months afterwards, the babies were normal weight. And well, that made sense because you gained most of your weight in your last trimester. So if you have normal calories in your last trimester, the babies caught up. However, the children that were conceived during the famine and born afterwards, most of them had higher rates of obesity for the rest of their lives. And guess what? Their children also had higher rates of obesity. So this lasted for two generations. Okay, so in Dutch, there are you know, people that were dealing with obesity and people that were small in stature based on when they were born during this Dutch hunger winter, and this affected their children too. So it turns out that there is imprinting based on parents and what's happening with their nutrition. We also know that often obese parents have an increased likelihood of obese children. For years, it was thought it was just environment. Hey, the parents are eating poorly, over-consuming, not exercising. The children would do the same. So it was an environment. It turns out that is not the case, that obese parents can actually have defective imprinting on the genes, and that defective imprinting is passed to the children, giving them a more likelihood of being obese later in life. And of course, I'm showing the, a clip from the movie WALL-E, where basically humans trash the earth, got up on these giant spaceships and left and waited to return when the earth healed itself. But on these spaceships, they didn't have to do anything. They just kind of rode around in carts and ate all day. And everybody was large and lazy. And yeah, yeah, Wally, great movie, loved it. So this is an example of how moms can affect their children. We have good examples of that. We're starting to understand how this works. Uh, can what happened to dads be passed on to their children as well? The answer is, we think so. There's still some research that needs to be done on this. We don't know. The reason why I include this is because my dad is a Vietnam vet. He was a Navy corpsman attached to a Marine division in Vietnam. He was there in 1967, 1968, and he had 100% exposure to something called Agent Orange. This was a defoliating agent. They they sprayed it on the trees to kill all the vegetation so they could see the enemy. We don't know the effects of this, but we do know that there are some effects that we've seen in laboratory animals that affect kidneys and other functioning of the body. There's even some evidence that PTSD experienced by the soldiers can actually lead to behavioral problems in their children due to not just environment, but to epigenetic inheritance. So yes, there is evidence of this. Like I said, we're starting to see some more of this. We're starting to study it more. And uh, I'm sure we'll find more on the father's side of how they can do it. There's no reason to believe they can't based on how we know that moms can definitely imprint on their children. Okay. Well, this has been another episode of Tom Kennedy Science. And this concludes my series on gene expression. The next series of lectures will be on viruses. How exciting. Until next time.